Um, all right. So, yes, I have 15 minutes. Obviously, the uh, the title is pretty uh, <clears throat> it's pretty ambitious. Um, so, well, to to your question, I think the answer uh, is well. It, it, the good news is that it depends a lot on on us collectively. So, I'm going to try and dive in uh, a bit like more like concretely on uh, well what that means entails, like to sort of like see this, this vision of a world where data, technology, uh, humans, machines, like work, work together um, for yeah, the, the greater good and the survival of our species and, and the Earth. Um, all right, so first of all, so um, just by way of quick introduction, so I'm, I'm not a data scientist. Uh, I'm a development economist by training. Uh, I'm a demographer. I got into uh, like big data about eight years ago, um, and we can talk if you're interested later about how. And I got very, very interested in, in, in big data, both the applications of big data and the political implications uh, of big data. So that's sort of my background. And I'm also a, a cartoonist, so that's also like some of the things that I bring to my uh, work and, and thinking. Uh, so hopefully I will survive because of, I don't know, creativity, uh, as we've heard. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, okay, so I'm going to skip the first 10 slides like very quickly. So basically it's about framing these questions in the larger context of the fears and concerns uh, about data, big data, like surveillance, the NSA, end of privacy, end of data minimization. Uh, there are lots of like doomsayers uh, like, you know, around the world. I, I understand, I mean, I'm also like French, as you can probably hear, so like, uh, like you know, in, in the US, the feel is sometimes a bit different, it's more like positive, and, and, but also sometimes like a, bit, a bit naive and sort of like, you know, techno-scientific, uh, so I try to strike a balance, uh, but nevertheless, sometimes I get a bit tired by people saying it's horrible and, you know, it's the end of the world and, you know, we should stop everything, um, which, which was not really the feeling that I got, um, that I got today. But of course, there are lots and lots of challenges. So my question in general in my work and today is basically how can we make the best out of like this sort of like digital revolution? How can we save in particular big data from itself, but also save big data from big mouths? So which are, you know, those saying it's horrible uh, and what should we actually do about it? In particular, can we uh, imagine and design better like data systems? I mean, there's been a lot of discussions about the future of technology, but we haven't really, haven't really heard a lot about data, which is the fuel of all of this. I mean, like machine learning, AI, like nothing works without, uh, without data. So, yeah, how can we design like data systems and standards uh, to sort of do what we've been you know, talking about this morning, to sort of like brighter uh, future? So I'm gonna skip this very quickly. Um, it's one of the things I've written most about it, like, like five years ago, about how we should think of data as an ecosystem or big data as an ecosystem and not just talk about the data itself. Um, so there are like different reasons and implications for that, but I will just like, you know, skip that in the interest of time. Um, so increasingly, uh, so three years ago, everything was about big data um, with lots of definitions. Now it's increasingly about AI. So just a quick word about uh, AI because it matters for like, the, the, the key concept that I want to talk about, which is human AI and how we can build a human artificial intelligence where machines and humans work together. Um, so quickly, the, the gist of AI and, and of machine learning is that you get to a system, to an AI, uh, a lot of input data and you ask the system to predict some like predetermined outcome. And in particular, so Google does that. Anything like Amazon, that's how it works, like the Facebook feed. So it's trying to like match input and output data. And in the middle, you have uh, what's called here like the hidden layers. So this may be a bit technical, but that's really the gist is that you have a system where data like fuels and feeds the system. And it can tell you, for instance, you, you ask a computer, is it a cat or a dog? And then it's gonna say it's a cat. And then it's going to get it wrong, and many, 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 many iterations later, it's going to, write, it's going to find the right recipe. All right? It's going to look at a picture later of a cat, and it's going to say, now I've learned to recognize the features of, of a cat. So it, and then it finds the little nodes here that works. It's, it's about, it's able to find, like, to, it's the credit assignment function. So it's about reinforcing like, the sets of, 
of, of steps that help the AI get the right result. So now there are many applications of this in the real world. Um, so with machine learning, uh, we people are able to, for instance, predict or infer um, poverty from cell phone activity. And it's a machine learning like technique. It's just you take lots of input data, which are cell phone activity, um, and, then you, 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 and then you try, that's your input data, and you try to predict the output data, which is poverty rates from, sur for, from surveys. And then the machine is going to try and like correlate, like find the best correlations over and over and over, and in the end you have a model that, that is able to predict poverty from cell phone activity. Now, moving on to the sort of implications, of course privacy is a very, very big one. One of the main takeaway lessons from the past couple of years in like privacy research is that anonymization is not sufficient. So it, it's not sufficient to take out your name in a, data, in a database and replace it by some like you know, just strings, because we're so unique that we can al always be re-identified. It's not about like finding your name, it's about saying this person is one and only in a whole data set because of the uniqueness of how we, how we behave. So what that means is that we have to find and design new systems to protect privacy, which are not just about anonymizing data. And this led to the development of a project which is called the Open Algorithms Project, which I will talk about. But privacy is also more than just uh, like not you know, being hidden. It's also about agency. It's also about so privacy as the right to dignity and self-determination. And that's a, that I think is like key in everything we've talked about. Like it is our responsibility and right to, as data emitters, we produce those data. We produce the data on which the, like the future system of the digital economy is going to work. Is going, we produce this fuel. So we should have a say in how they are used. So, and we should also learn from history. We've talk, we talk a lot about machine learning, like human learning also, I mean, is obviously central to all of this. We should reflect on the, on the, on the like, the, on the like, failures of the past, on the tensions, on the time it took for some technology to diffuse and try to shrink that and get the most out of the, of the new technology. So concretely, okay, so this notion of a human AI. So think of it as, human AI is, so think of a system, the world, like societies, that you would be a human artificial intelligence system. Okay, so where the principles of artificial intelligence apply to entire societies, meaning we feed the system with data the same way you feed an AI with data. The SDGs are, are some of them. Um, like official statistics are some of them. So we feed them with data and we are able to finally see better like what works and what doesn't work, as an AI does. An AI learns by being told Oh, you did that, and this was the outcome. You got it wrong. Try again. So what if this principle was applied to entire societies? Then I think it would be like pretty, uh, yeah, pretty, pretty trans transformative. There's a lot of systems and, and policies that just like so happen, and they're never really evaluated. Uh, there's no transparency. There's no accountability. So it's really about this vision of a human AI is really about using the principles and the tools of AI and apply them to entire societies. So we've heard a lot about this morning about human machine being complementary, etc. That's you know sort of it. It's how to to take to make the most and take the most of both machines and uh, and, and humans, but applied to like entire societies. So. So there are many challenges to this. Um, I can't, you know, I don't have time. I have like five and, and a half minutes left. So, um, like fake news, you can't have a system like that, like a human AI system that works, if half the facts or the data that it works with are, are like false. If there is no common agreement on what a fact is. Um, so, like analog segregation, fake news, etc. Uh, of course, is a, is a major impediment. Uh, another is lack of appropriate data connections. Just the fact that for all the talk about big data, like the ocean of data, we don't have access 
to the data that could feed this system. So what are these data? Mostly, right now, they are private sector data. So they are data that are collected by private sector companies. And we don't want them out. All right? We don't want our credit card transactions to be out in the open. So, but we still want the insights that are in those data sets to then fuel this sort of like human AI uh, system. So how do you reconcile both when, so this project so that I'm uh, also like directing and piloting in Senegal and Colombia is trying to like crack this conundrum. So which is how can you access private sector data to fuel and feed this human AI system without the risks of exposing very sensitive personal data. So what we've developed with MIT, Imperial College London, um, Orange, Telefonica, and, and, and uh, so yeah, Imperial College London, and the World Economic Forum and others, is this system, this platform called, called Opal, where we send queries, so open algorithms, questions to private sector data. So a question could be, what is the poverty, what is your assessment of the poverty level in this city based on cell phone activity? All you need is the answer. You, you don't want to see the data. So it's a question and answer uh, mechanism. So that's the sort of like, the goal is really to build these like first generation data systems and standards. To date, there is, just, there is no way to access private sector data at scale in a safe way in the world, okay? It is crazy. There are data and there are lots of insights in telecom data, in, in credit card, in bank data, in Facebook data, in uh, like very sensitive data. And again, we don't want them out. We want to respect privacy and agency of people. But we need to be able like, to, like, to analyze, mine those data to yield insights that will then help actually hold like, bad governments into account and just say, like, look, we've taken a lot. This doesn't work. You're claiming that this works. This doesn't work. So it needs to be changed. You're bad. You need to be removed from office. So it's actually pretty political. So you can look it up. It's opalproject.org. Um, and I think, it's, uh, I think it's really going tr to transform how like, development works, how policy making works uh, in the next uh, yeah, decades. Because for the first time, I think we'll be able to mine those very sensitive data safely and at scale. So we've started with two pilots, as I said, in Colombia and Senegal. Uh, so with Telefonica and Orange as data partners and the national statistical offices of these countries. So it's not like techno utopia. It's not like we don't want to yeah, look in like, you know, people's backyard and stuff. So it's, it's, really, um, it's really happening. One of the key features is that there's also a governance system to ask uh, like people like, locally uh, which case studies they're interested in, which, which SDGs, for instance, they're most interested in. So after this, I'm going to Dakar uh, for three days uh, so to work with the local like, advisory board there uh, to sort of yeah, follow up on the, on, the, on the status of the project. And last two slides, one is, so those kinds of approaches where you, we do research as a group like this. Uh, so we do research, there's also a lot of uh, like strategy work, a lot of uh, capacity building work that, that we do. Um, so one project right now in uh, Colombia and Mexico uh, is about like fighting crime. So we use uh, Telefonica data, so cell phone data, to understand like crime patterns, and understand the drivers of crime based on how people move around, the density of people, etc. But again, we don't extract the data. We just ask questions to the data. And then we work with the national police, with the municipalities, uh, with the national, the national statistical office uh, of these countries. So it's very so like on the ground. And I spend, I don't know, way too much time in planes or on planes and stuff, but it's really happening on the ground, and I think that's the only way to do it. And this is the last slide, and I have 43 seconds. So I think the key to all this, we've talked about this, but very concretely, it's really about, it's, it's very human. So it's really about building capacities, building connections. Um, so I, I've talked quite a bit in recent years about like data literacy and what that means and entails, like above and beyond being good data cruncher, it's also being about being like, a, like a, an agent and like, like citizens in the digital um, era. So we've done a lot of those capacity building programs uh, in, in like, and, and trainings in Kenya, in Mexico, et cetera. Um, and I think that's the, yeah, that's the, at least my, my small contribution 
or attempts at contributing uh, to building this sort of like human AI system for the future. Thank you.